Ladies and gentlemen, in 1987, the Secretary General of the Soviet Communist Party, Mikhail Gorbachev, published in the Soviet Union a book called Perestroika, and it was rapidly translated into English and other major languages. This was a book that attempted to systematically present Gorbachev's thinking on domestic and foreign policy and to justify it. The book said that perestroika of the economy, the restructuring of the Soviet command economy system, was something important if the Soviet Union were to be competitive with the West and were to overcome what Gorbachev himself called the economic stagnation of the past. This was a political assessment as much as an economic one aimed at his predecessors and especially at Brezhnev and Chernyenko. Gorbachev also spoke of Perestroika as a return to true Leninism. These are his terms. Uh, as an attempt by the party to revitalize itself and in the process to grab again control over the destiny of Soviet society. Because Gorbachev said the party had sadly lost control uh, during the stagnation of the past decades. Now, this set of justifications for a Secretary General of the Communist Party's program was unexampled. First of all, it was an admission of the failure of past policy, and a failure that had extended back for several decades. It was an admission that the party itself had failed, and even he himself had failed, because the party had lost control over events, and the party was not supposed to do that. It was constitutionally to be the guiding force in Soviet society and in every aspect of Soviet society. When, at one point in the book, Gorbachev spoke about perestroika as a revolution, as another October, I must confess that my breath was taken away. Once in Soviet history before, somebody had tried a second October Revolution. That was Comrade Stalin in the first five-year plan. It was a big departure from the new economic policy of the 20s. And now Gorbachev was advertising that what he was contemplating was nothing less than a revolution from above. Ideologically, this basket of justifications is very odd and remains odd, I think, to this day. But economically, politically, by the end of 1987, early 1988, Gorbachev had very little to show for his rhetoric. There were, however, some developments to which one can attribute, uh, which one can attribute to Gorbachev and Perestroika. And these developments took place mainly in the field of international policy. 1985, Gorbachev went to Geneva. He met with Mr. Reagan there. Nothing substantive was accomplished except that the two leaders hit it off well, there developed between them a kind of personal chemistry and trust that would be very important later. Gorbachev began to speak in public time after time about the need to reduce the level of tensions between the Soviet Union and the West, to control armaments, both conventional and nuclear argument, armaments. And he grew visibly frustrated when, after a prolonged period of advertising his willingness uh, to enter into serious negotiations to reduce tensions and to reduce uh, dangerous armaments, there seemed to be uh, no uh, 
response, no excitement anyway, uh, from Washington. In Washington, the thinking was that we will see when we see, that deeds are more important than words. We've heard pretty words before. We'd like to see it demonstrated in certain concrete proposals that uh, the Soviet Union is serious about arms reduction. And in Washington, I think, I, I may uh, offend some people here who had other opinions, but my general impression was that the policy elites were skeptical about the domestic reforms of Gorbachev. They understood that the system as it had co been constituted had an inertia uh, of its, uh, or a momentum, if it had momentum of, it, of its own, and therefore it wouldn't be changed by Gorbachev's program. However, the more Gorbachev talked and the more frustration that he expressed at party people who seemed to be dragging their feet in the implementation of the domestic reforms, the more people he replaced with uh, it looked like able types that were willing to experiment with the economy, uh, the more he invade for Washington to take the arms control proposal seriously, the more interest this aroused on this side of the Atlantic, and a certain momentum in the direction of arms control, negotiations for reducing conventional weaponry in Europe developed, and a certain interest developed, I think concomitantly, that the domestic proposals that Gorbachev was making might be, in fact, the beginning of something important. It was said, uh, sort of semi-dismissively, uh, by one uh, punster, that uh, Gorbachev was Khrushchev in a $900 suit. But remember Khrushchev. Khrushchev made a significant series of changes in the communist system, even if he was a believing socialist. So this seeming put down had an element of complement in it as well. Now inside of the Soviet Union, you may be surprised to learn, there was also skepticism about Gorbachev. But there was also the sense that this person was a real force, that by virtue of his office and his telegenic uh, self-presentation, that he might be able to affect significant change. And so there was nervousness about where he was headed in Perestroika. Hardliners in the government really did dig in their, field, their, their heels. And people like Yeltsin, who was a member of the Politburo, really did redouble their efforts to persuade Gorbachev to go farther and make the Perestroika reforms something that would have an impact, a tangible, palpable impact on people's lives. Below the surface, there was, in other words, an opposition that was real, and also a slowly developing constituency for real change. Yeltsin was demanding real results in the economy. At the republic level, people were gently pushing for greater autonomy, more independence for the heads of the party apparatus in the republics to make decisions without having to uh, run them by the authorities in the Kremlin. And there were amongst intellectuals, and uh, this is true in Russia, but also true in the republics, there was a growing demand for real, substantial, and meaningful democratization, not in the limited sense that Gorbachev had first uh, mentioned it. So there was, in fact, by late 1987, early 1988, 
a kind of polarization that was taking place at the top of the Soviet leadership. There was an undeclared war, maybe, Cold War still, but uh, people knew the consequences, knew the stakes. At the top of the Communist Party, there were those who were Gorbachevites, who were reformists, real reformists, and there were those who uh, were not comfortable with reform uh, and resisted it. So I think by 1988, the Soviet Union, and in particular the Soviet leadership, faced a kind of existential choice. Would there be real perestroika, irreversible perestroika, or not? It was clear that the original basket of proposals was a failure, a non-starter. If there would be real reform, there would have to be much more far-reaching proposals made and implemented. And these reforms would have to include political democratization, not just democracy on the shop floor, but some easing of the censorship, some greater possibility of people to assemble and express their opinions, maybe democratization in the sense of real secret balloting for multiple candidates in an election. There would have to be a devolution on some substantial scale of authority to the republics. So there would have to be a decentralization of power in the system, and there would have to be marketization. That is to say, the entrepreneurs who had been licensed would have to be licensed in greater numbers now. The market discipline, self-financing of industry and all that that Gorbachev had talked about, that would have to be real, allowed to emerge. The Soviet Union, in other words, would have to accommodate democracy, decentralization, and the market, and these were really systemic changes. They weren't marginal changes, tiny steps that had precedent in Soviet history. They were real steps into the void, into the unknown for Russian society. And notice, if you have been following this course carefully, that these changes, which I have talked about as being necessities if there was going to be real reform, are the same things that were talked about under Nicholas II. Would the constitutional system be meaningful or not? What was the degree of democracy to be permitted in the empire? What about the relationship between the center, the core of the empire, and the nationalities? And what about the role of the free market? If you license a free market, it creates social antagonisms. So the questions with which Russia had begun the century were now the questions in 1988 that were the neuralgic points, the, the items of debate on the table. So we have come, in a sense, full circle by 1988. The decisions that were made over the next few years led to the disintegration of the Soviet Union as it had been constituted in 1924 and as it had been developed under Stalin. So this was an important phase in the de-Stalinization of the country as well as being a world historical event in its own right. Let us look at certain aspects of the decisions that were made. In the economic sphere, there were far-reaching reforms adopted between 1988 and 1990. Real statistics 
were going to be published for the first time. Statistics are the lifeblood of an economy. And they have to be accurate in order for anybody to know where to invest capital, in order for anyone to know where the problems or the opportunities are in an economy. And frankly, Gorbachev understood that there weren't a body of reliable statistics in existence. And he argued, and he won a victory in the Politburo simply to get the authorization to publish real statistics. Gorbachev turned his attention to agriculture. And he understood that there was an ideological barrier that prevented him from granting ownership of land to the peasantry. But what he wanted to do was the next best thing. He wanted to permit long-term leases of land to peasant families. That way you could have the fact of ownership over a given amount of landed uh, arable without advertising that you were surrendering to the capitalist principle of private property. Gorbachev spoke about enhancing the possibilities for cooperatives to develop in the cities. That means private business relationships. Uh, one statistic that I read in early 1989 said that by that time there were already 75,000 cooperatives licensed. And Gorbachev was pressing for more. He wanted the consumer in the Soviet Union to be well satisfied, and he thought the way to go about this was to permit the organization of more cooperatives. Now this had all sorts of implications for the lives of Soviet people. If you permit people to organize a business and you allow them to keep a portion of their income, and if they become rich compared to their neighbors, they are going to show that they are rich by buying goods which are not available to their neighbors. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes-Benz? Mercedes-Benz and Volvos and Saabs were all over St. Petersburg and Moscow at the end of the Gorbachev period. And to the Soviet working person, this was a shock. At the same time, it was an encouragement. And it's a shock because before this, just party bosses had had access to these fine commodities. And now it's possible for a private citizen to do it. And one resented these uh, conspicuously consuming heads of cooperatives for their success. But you know, you resent, but you also emulate. You want the same for yourself. The government knew that there was this envy, and so it jawboned against speculators. Speculators means people that are rich and flaunt it. They've got it and they flaunt it. And uh, this wasn't obviously something that was uh, politically profitable in the short run. But in very few cases did these so-called speculators wind up in jail for their speculation. This was jawboning for political purposes and nothing else. There was an attempt to put real teeth in the self-financing of enterprises reform that Gorbachev had advertised earlier, but uh, hadn't been very successful. Um, to a certain extent, by the end of his tenure in office, self-financing was working. There were some companies keeping their own books that were on the verge of bankruptcy, couldn't pay their employees, and for all practical purposes, they had to pull the plug on production. There were other cases where uh, state enterprises, because they couldn't profitably manufacture some good, like soap, uh, 
pulled out of soap manufacturing. And so there was an opportunity for private cooperatives to begin producing soap, but it took a long time to gear up. So there was a period, you call it the dirty period of the early 90s, when people had a hard time getting a hold of laundry soap and, and uh, personal cleansing devices. In the summer of 1990, Gorbachev began to think about the so-called Shatalin plan. Now, Shatalin was a, an economist. He was an academic, very well respected, probably one of the three or four most able economists uh, of the uh, Soviet uh, period. And he proposed that the Soviet Union, in a period of 500 days, make a transition from the command economy to the market economy. Shatalin worked out the details of this plan. He pressed them on the political leadership. Gorbachev listened. He was clearly tempted to adopt the Shatalin plan. But he walked all the way up to the brink, and then he pulled back. For some reason, maybe it was his idealism. Gorbachev felt that socialism was a just economic system because it encouraged equality and compassion. Or maybe it was because the security apparatus and the army said, uh -uh, there will be no free enterprise in the Soviet Union. And gave Gorbachev to understand that if he adopted the Shatalin plan, he would be removed from office. Maybe that's the reason that he balked. But whatever the reason, he walked up to the brink, gave body signals that he was going to sign on to the Shatalin plan, and then stepped back. The cynic said, this proves what we've been saying all along. Socialism and the market system are incompatible. Gorbachev was talking about a regulated market, a quote unquote socialist market. And these people who were criticizing him said, no, a market is a market. It is free, but it is not socialist, and it is not regulated. You may be surprised to learn that in the 1990s, uh, one of the most prestigious people, states people, in the world was Margaret Thatcher. Because it, she was understood by the Soviets as being somebody that transformed an economy in which there was a heavy dose of state ownership into a radically free market uh, economy. And of course, people who lived in England and had to live under the effects of Thatcherism might not have liked it so much. But from the point of view of Eastern Europe, which was trying to discard the command model of the economy, Thatcher and Thatcherism seemed like admirable things uh, to emulate and to study. Political reforms. There's a long list of them, and they're all of them significant. Glossness, or publicity, openness, was extended between 88 and 91, so that by the end, there was virtually no censorship in the Soviet Union. I can remember friends visiting uh, me in South Bend from Moscow uh, in 1991, and they brought with them copies of the first newspapers free published newspapers that they'd got a hold of in Moscow. And they said proudly, see? You see what we can do here? There was the publication of so-called anti-Stalinist literature. For example, Dr. Zhivago, Pasternak's book, was published in this period. Volkogonov, Dmitry Volkogonov's biography of Stalin, a very critical assessment of Stalin, was published in this period. A man, a film director called Abuladze, was able to show in Moscow 
a film called Repentance, which is uh, a kind of a caution, a very moving cautionary tale about an everyman dictatorship. The dictator is dressed in brown, and he could be a fascist, he could be a Nazi, or he could be Stalin. And the uh, emotional resonance of this film, which was understood as an anti-Stalinist tract, was very powerful. People wept at theaters, and uh, they were also proud because it was possible finally on the film to see uh, the crimes of Stalin demonstrated. Solzhenitsyn, even some of his books, began to be serialized at the very end of the Gorbachev period. I remember my shock when I went to the Soviet Union in 1992, just a year after the formal dissolution there, and somebody came up in the subway and said, would you like to buy a copy of the Gulag Archipelago? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! In 1987, the government gave authority to Soviet citizens to organize what was called unofficial groups. In other words, this was freedom of assembly that was being cautiously recognized. Now, what kind of groups came into existence? Well, the Union of Soviet Motorcyclists. That was one of them. But uh, there were others. The Society for Democratic Perestroika, which was really a anti-communist, mostly, organization. The so-called Pamyat Society. Now, uh, this was a very disagreeable, nationalist, anti-Semitic group. But also, there was a society called Memorial. Memorial uh, Society was designed to raise money for the building of the long-delayed monument to the victims of Stalinist repression. So groups of every ideological stripe began to organize themselves. In 1988, Gorbachev managed to win approval for reform of the Communist Party itself. The party agreed that for every position there should be competitive elections. It agreed that there should be a retirement age of 65 for members of the party, even the general secretary. And this was clearly a response to the uh, phenomenon of the 80s when the aged elite had died before the eyes of uh, party members and Soviet citizens. You're wanting to know, well, did Gorbachev agree to resign himself at age of 65? No. There was a grandfather clause. <laughs> if we ever have term limits in this country, I'm sure it will come with a grandfather clause. Startlingly, under extreme pressure from below, from people of Moscow, in January of 1990, the party agreed to the abrogation of Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution. Article 6 was the one that specified that the party would have the right to guide all areas and institutions in Soviet life. Now, let us stop for a moment. I remember clearly when Zbigniew Brzezinski was asked to comment on PBS about this reform, and he said, on this day, Bolshevism ceased to exist. He said, what, what you have in power now is a Menshevik government. In other words, a socialist government, social democratic government, the kind that you might have in Western Europe, even. But Bolshevism ceased to exist because what Bolshevism was about from the beginning was the control of society by the vanguard of the proletariat, by the elite, which had a higher level of historical consciousness. The abolition of Article 6 of the Soviet Constitution, therefore, is an enormous divide. 
1988, there were efforts to reform local Soviets. Multi-party, multi-candidate elections were permitted in the Soviets. The right to nominate candidates for a position in the local councils was given to the people that lived in that district. 500 people, if they signed a petition, could put somebody's name in nomination for election. So the Soviet was opened up to the populace as a whole, not just to the party elites. And then in 88 and 89, there was a reform of the central government, the legislative branch of the government, which hadn't really existed as a legislative branch. It was just people raising their hand with their party tickets, yes, 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 and rubber stamping decisions made by the party. All that changed in 88 and 89. There was to be a nationally elected Congress of People's Deputies. Some of these deputies were to be picked from the localities by uh, the people themselves in open elections, secret ballot, and so on. Other members of the Congress of People's Deputies were to be chosen by organizations, such as the uh, trade union movement, such as the Communist Party, such as the Academy of Sciences. And in the event, there were surprises. I think Mr. Gorbachev tried to manipulate the uh, constituency of this, of the, uh, of the nature of this body by having so many places reserved for election by organization. But in the Academy of Sciences, for example, which was a quite conservative organization, they argued and they argued and they argued, and they finally elected Andrei Sakharov to one of the Academy's positions. So the arch dissident of the 60s and 70s and 80s, a person that many Soviets regarded as a secular saint because of his concern for the common good and human rights, he was elected, to Mr. Gorbachev's surprise, to the Congress of People's Deputies. And there was to be a second house, a Supreme Soviet, which was to be selected from this larger body, the Congress of People's Deputies. And the Supreme Soviet was going to elect a chairman. Gorbachev wrote the job description for himself. Uh, and it was going to have the right to frame legislation. In 1990, Gorbachev decided that it was time to establish the office of Soviet presidency, and he made it elective, although he himself was advised not to stand for election. He simply took the office for the first five years, and of course he didn't manage to uh, stay out uh, the term. He wrote the office uh, description for the presidency, vesting tremendous powers in the office. Andrei Sakharov and others were very critical of Gorbachev because he concentrated so much authority in the hands of the presidency. They worried if somebody less reformist-minded than Gorbachev should become Soviet president that there might be a new Stalin dictatorship. Events proved that this was uh, an idle concern because the forces in the country were moving to disintegration of the power and the nation rather than to uh, the integration of the power. Now, if we characterize the program of radical Perestroika, what can we say about it? First of all, it seems to me that this list of reforms demonstrates that Politics was most important to Gorbachev rather than economics. He didn't adopt 
certain economic reforms and wait and see how they worked out. He was frustrated that the original program of Perestroika had not been implemented because of political opposition in the party and the bureaucracy. And so he chose to implement reforms. He broadened the economic package, of course, but he chose to implement them first and foremost by changing the political constellation of power, the structure of government, the structure of the party. This was a big gamble. It assumed that the party would follow loyally behind him because he was the general secretary of the party. And the assumption, even in these days of democratization, is that party discipline would remain in existence. All of those meetings at which people raised their hand in public was going to carry over, Gorbachev hoped, in support of himself. This program assumed that the state would be able to lead society. In other words, this is a statist assumption. It is an elitist assumption. Russians, when they talk about revolution, talk about the tradition of revolution from above. The biggest changes in Russian history, Peter the Great's decision, for example, to build Petersburg and to westernize the country, the abolition of serfdom in 1861, the Stalin uh, first five-year plan, they all came from the top. So Gorbachev was looking at the state as the mover, the maker of Soviet history, and he was thinking that the people would follow. He was assuming that the USSR was a nation state, that there was such a thing as the Soviet people. That is to say, he was gambling on the cohesion of the country. And this was a very big assumption, because as soon as you license people to speak their minds, to write their history, to organize informal groups, then the ressentiment, the resentments of the past surface. Ukrainians could talk about the terror famine. The Cossacks, Cossacks, not Cossacks, but Cossacks with the K, could talk about the loss of a million people or so during collectivization. The so-called punished peoples in the Caucasus, the Chechens and their neighbors, the Crimean Tatars could talk about what Stalin did to them. And the Russians, for that matter, could talk about how they had borne the burden of empire during the Soviet period. They had suffered more proportionally than other nationalities, whether it's true or not, that's what some of them thought. And they could ask the painful question, what have we gotten out of Soviet power? Is it not time for there to be an independent Russian republic? So in other words, great Russian nationalism could raise its head. And I think because Gorbachev was an idealist, partly, he did not understand the force of these nationalist arguments. Socialism to him was an international phenomenon. It was a rational prescription for compassion, for distribution of economic wealth, for a way to lead one's life without fraternal tension and warfare. Nationalism was superstition. It was somehow bourgeois, maybe even medieval. Religious hatreds and all of that, these were long ago past in his mind. And so when he confronted on the streets in a tour of the Baltic people that demanded the recognition of 
independence for the Baltic states. And he tried to explain to them, well, don't you understand it's not rational? You're a part of the Soviet system and we'll work things out together. He was surprised to run into people's resentment of Russia, of the Soviet conquest, people's reminders that they had suffered during the Sovietization of the country. He was taken aback and shocked by these events. Gorbachev was assuming that the citizens of the Soviet Union were mature, that they understood that the economy was interdependent, that it was in everyone's interest to stay together. And that definition of political maturity, unfortunately for him, wasn't shared by everybody. Now, I'm going to say something that may surprise you a little. I don't think that he was wrong in a sense. Stalin had put the system together in a devilishly clever way. He had taken the nationalities and controlled them by a kind of mixture of their own national elites and appointees from the center. So the political elites were, as it were, international or inter-ethnic. The economy was set in such a way that all parts of the country were interdependent. Gorbachev, if he thought just from the economic perspective or the political perspective, could not believe that the work that had been done by Stalin and his predecessors to devise this system could be undone. Even if people wanted to, they would soon run up against the brick wall of reality. He was, in a sense, far-sighted, although he was wrong in the short term, because look at what, has, what is happening today. Economically speaking, there is, as we speak, a slow reintegration of the Soviet Union, although the, uh, I should say, of the Union rather than the Soviet Union, uh, because it is in the economic interests of the now independent successor states to cooperate closely with each other. And also Gorbachev knew something about Soviet reality that might not uh, penetrate our Western eyes. Over the years of Soviet power, people from this part of the country and that part of the country had intermarried. I have a friend at Notre Dame who's a Estonian politician and diplomat. He was incidentally a member of the Supreme Soviet uh, in 1989 named Igor Grazin. He is married to a woman who is Muscovite, a Russian Jewish person. When Estonia became independent from the Soviet Union, this marriage was facing a question. Where are we going to live? Will we be citizens of Estonia or citizens of the Soviet Union? Now the question is citizens of Russia. I know a Moscow historian by the name of Larisa Zukharova who is Georgian-Armenian by birth. Suddenly, overnight in 1991, she could not visit her relatives without a passport. So this was a living reality for people in the Soviet Union, and Gorbachev could not think that it would be undone uh, by an act of political will. Nevertheless, Gambles are gambles. And this gamble led, in 1991, to an interlocking series of events that finally uh, called out of existence the Soviet Union that had uh, been on the books formally since 1924 and had uh, been fashioned in the, in the Civil War.
the details of the crisis of 1991 and what came after them we will discuss next time.